trying to be justified, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor circumcision, uncircumcision. I understand that from time to time, Dr. Tool invites people back from history to tell the story of their lives and also to leave a lesson for living in our own Christian lives. And today I'll ask God for a special blessing. I'll ask God through the gift of the Holy Spirit to help me communicate to you, not through a Scottish road, but in American English, so you can better understand. <laughs> My name is John Knox Witherspoon. I was born on the 5th of February, 1722 near Edinburgh, Scotland. My father was a Presbyterian minister, James. My mother, Anne, was a descendant of John Knox, the reformer of the Scottish church, and the father of the Presbyterian church in your country as well. Well, I attended the University of Edinburgh, got my MA and also my divinity degree. And then I was called to Beath Church, which is near Edinburgh. Upon that calling, I was ordained to the ministry by the Church of Scotland. There I served for a few years. While I was there, I enjoyed fishing and curling. You've known that from your Olympics, I believe you call them. And also, I enjoyed golf on some days. Other days, not quite so much. I also was concerned as a staunch Presbyterian the fact is that Bonnie Prince Charlie was being forwarded as someone to take over the throne of Great Britain. He was Roman Catholic. I didn't support that because I was afraid, as in the past, when Roman Catholics went to the throne, they persecuted the Presbyterians. And so, my beetle, and a beetle in the Scottish church is a layman who's a combination of clerk of session and <coughs> liturgist. He decided and I decided we should go and fight the battle of Falkirk. Well, I went as chaplain. He brought his heavy family sword with him to be a strong warrior. We both went and we were both taken prisoners. We were prisoners of war and put in a, cha in a castle keep for quite a while. And there my health deteriorated. And ever since that time in the dungeon, the fact was that the loud sounds bothered me and I was hypersensitive to strong smells and I developed insomnia, all of which were with me for the rest of my life. Oh my. And then I was called to the Paisley Church in Scotland. Paisley was a wonderful and lively community. And while I was there, we had a, a wonderful relationship. And at the same time, I was an author and scholar. I wrote often. And I wrote in Scots Magazine, which was a magazine that circulated in Scotland, but also in the colonies. So it was well known in both places. Also, there were two parties in the church at that time. There were the moderates, so-called. They were strange, I felt in my own mind. They were deists. They believed God had created the world and like a clockmaker, had just stood back and let it wind now with no involvement in the lives of the people. Christ was a good idea and a good philosophy, but not alive among congregations. That bothered me. And also they took vices rather casually, and I didn't like that either. The other party was called the Populist Party. I was a staunch member of that party. We believed in Jesus Christ as the only salvation. We believed in the scriptures to be the word of God. We believe that what you believe dictates how you behave. We look down on immorality, and we were heralds of Jesus Christ. Well, that's what was it all about. And the fact is that Paisley Congregation was wonderful to me. I enjoyed them and loved them, and they loved me as well. As a matter of fact, when other committees came to select me as their minister for their church, and the vote went before the congregation to release me. Again and again, they stood up and shouted, no, no, and never got one vote in support of that motion. It was 
a wonderful congregation. And the fact is that as I continued in the church, even though I was a member of that minority party, the populists, the fact is that I was chair of many general assembly committees. And also at one point I became the moderator of the whole Church of Scotland. And then something happened. It changed my whole life. I got a communication from the colonies in America. They wanted me to become the sixth president of the College of New Jersey. It would later be called Princeton University. I told my wife Peggy, who I had married. Now Peggy, I told you, was a descendant of John Knox. If I've told you that before, it's intentional because she told everyone <laughs> <laughs> how proud she was. She says, I'll no go across the Atlantic and I'll be bored. And upstairs she went to go to bed. <laughs> and solved that, I thought. <laughs> but less than a year later, Richard Stockton, who was a trustee of the college, came over to Scotland to try and urge me again. He walked in the door and said, I'm here from the college in New Jersey. And my wife said, I'm away to bed. <laughs> <laughs> that was her vote. But yet another year passed, and along came Dr. Benjamin Rush, a famous physician on both sides of the Atlantic and a trustee of the college. He finally persuaded Peggy Ah, uh, she said, I hope the ride's nice so bad. Well, we'll see. But it was a bad ride. Oh, coming over the ocean, 11 weeks on a wee boat, as she called it, it was terrible. But we landed in Philadelphia, and there we were greeted by some of the students from the college. And they followed us all the way down to Princeton. And there the street was lined with other students, and they were shouting, unite us! Unite us, for they were in the same mind. The disagreement between the moderates, who you would call liberals, and the populists, who you would call conservatives. They wanted me to unite them, and that's what I tried to do. I established the curriculum so that it would reflect belief in the Bible, belief in a God active in our lives. Chapel was held daily. Science was honored because it helped explore God's creation, and things grew nicely and very well. Before I arrived, Parliament had passed the Stamp Act. Now the Stamp Act imposed a huge tax on all goods imported from Britain to the colonies. We couldn't abide that. As a matter of fact, a year before I arrived, students responded to the Stamp Act. Knowing what happened in Boston in the Tea Party, they raided the storehouse of tea at the campus and burned it all up. <laughs> they were a spirited group, no doubt about it. Well, I'm getting thirsty as well. I'm going to take a break. from New Jersey. Now in those days, communication was very difficult. And so each state selected those who supported the independence. And they rode from state to state with letters saying what was happening, for instance, in Maryland and also in, in New Jersey and New York, telling each other what was going on and uniting us in our efforts. Well, that was good. We we're moving toward independence. Congress declared that we would have Congress Day on Friday, May 17, 1776, when all the people were urged to go to their churches and to pray for the Declaration of Independence that it be signed and implemented. The people called it Congress Sunday, even though it was a Friday. But it also meant war was going to begin, and sure enough it did. And during that time, Nassau Hall, the main building at 
College of New Jersey, and the largest stone building in the colonies that still stands today. It was occupied by the British and their hired Hessians, the German soldiers, and they used the, the building for a stable. They burned the largest library in the colonies at that point. They took all of the special scientific instruments that we had had imported from Europe and dashed them. They were gone. It was a terrible thing. Equally terrible was my son who was killed in battle and another one who was taken as prisoner of war. And because of the deprivation of food and medicine, my daughter died in childbirth. It was a difficult time. But November 28th, 1782, the war ended. And we had victory. Victory and we were free at last. And it was a wonderful celebration throughout all the colonies and in Princeton, certainly. But there was much to be done. So much had been devastated. So much ruined. The disasters all around us. Buildings needed to be rebuilt. And at the same time, the $10,250 we had put away safely in the college treasury because of the new inflation. And your money now is only worth $240. What a terrible situation. I had to raise money. And so I did. I made the worst decision of my life. I decided to go to Great Britain to raise money. <laughs> Our recent enemies, the ones we had fought so valiantly against. And I went over there and my mission was a total failure. A total failure. But even worse, on the way back on the ship, we hit rough seas. I fell on the ship, hit my eye, and became permanently blind in one eye. I came home trying to get things going again at the college, trying to raise money. And Peggy, at age 66, died. Well, I was still raising money. I got on my horse and went up into New England, there to raise more money. But on the way, I fell off the horse and hit my head, and my other eye was blinded. Now I was totally blind, totally blind. I came back, and within two years after Peggy's death, I married a 24-year-old woman called Anne. <laughs> oh, it was the top, the talent. The top. <laughs> Almost as much as when we had two children. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, here I was, trying to get settled again. But I was still the pastor of the local church, totally blind. My son-in-law, my deceased daughter's husband, used to read scripture for me during the week. And also I dictated to him my sermons. And then he read them back to me. And I memorized them. Half hour, 40 minute sermons. And I gave them to the church on Sunday and people said, there's no difference in it. He still has the vitality and the power and the zeal. He's still a wonderful pastor for us. And then, on the 15th of November, I sent my cousin down to get a newspaper in town. And when he came back, he found me dead in the chair. A long life lived to God's glory. Well, the fact is that I think I had a strong influence. I made some notes and let me tell you what I accomplished by having taught those people who are my students, my influence and example. Of the 478 students I had at the College of New Jersey, one became president of the United States. His name was James Madison. One became a vice president, Aaron Burr. There were 114 clergymen who graduated and learned under my tutelage. 13 state governors three United States Supreme Court justices, 20 United States senators, 33 United States congressmen, and countless veterans of the American Revolution and active in their churches. God has blessed me, and I hope my being with you today has blessed you, and I have some lessons for you to learn, I hope. 
One is put God first. The God who is active in our lives, who has saved us through Jesus Christ. Don't be led by the culture in which you live. Don't take your lead from them. Take your lead from Scripture and from God's Word. Don't submit. Be moral people. Be people who trust in the Bible, believe in it, and live it. And give God thanks for this wonderful country in which we live. Now, the United States of America. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Particularly for the lives of those who, in coming and speaking to us, provide us perspective on our heritage. And also inspire us to be the people you call us to be in this generation. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.